time, we're always encouraged to see that God is using our live broadcasts to touch people's lives all over the world through SoulQuest right here in Jackson, Tennessee. Comment below and let us know what God's doing in your life. If you'd like to donate to this ministry and help bring these broadcasts to people all over the world, you can do that at our website at soulquestchurch.com. We'd love to see you any Sunday at our campus in Jackson, and we'd love to help you plan your visit at soulquestchurch.com. Now prepare your heart for a powerful word from the Word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Wow, good day already, amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want to speak to you this morning on the subject, what if? What if? Look with me, if you will, in chapter 15 and verse 1. We'll read down through verse 4. The Bible says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and which also you stand. Verse 2, By which also you are saved, if you hold fast to the words which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Verse 3 and 4. Watch this. This is very important. Verse 3 and 4. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. That Christ died. Everybody say died. Come on. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Now, it doesn't end there, right? It doesn't end there because there's so many world religions today where their prophet or their leader or their maybe Messiah, they may call him, he died. But here's the difference. The Bible says according to the Scriptures, verse 4, and that he was buried... And that he was, say it with me. One more time, what? Raised Raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. You see, here's the difference. Our God is not dead. Our God is not dead. He is alive and well today. And our whole Christian faith rest on the fact that God is not dead. He's not in the tomb anymore, but he's alive today. Let me date some of you. Harry Houdini. How many remember him? How many are his age? Wow. I'm, Aunt Vern, you did that one. I didn't say that. Aunt Vern, back here. yeah. Harry Houdini died in... October of 1926. You're not his age, Aunt Vern. He was said to have had the flexibility of an eel and the lives of a cat. You see, Harry Houdini was much more than just a magician. Harry Houdini was an escape artist. You see, they would take Harry Houdini and they would put him in a coffin. He would escape. They sold him up in a canvas. He would escape. They locked him in a high-security prison. He escaped. But in October of 1926, death laid his hand, its hands upon Harry Houdini. He told his wife, he said, Honey, if it's possible, I will come back. Honey, if it's possible, I will also escape death. He told her to be looking for him one year from the date that he died. That day came, and Houdini never, ever showed up. You see, death also laid its hand upon Jesus. And Jesus also prophesied. He said, hey, guys, in three days, I'm going to come back to life. As a matter of fact, his disciples didn't quite get it. I mean, they never really understood him. They followed him to a point, but they never really completely understood the kingdom of God. But Jesus said, in three days, I'm coming back. And that's exactly what he did. Listen, friend, there's only one message that I can give you today that will change your life. And here it is. The death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. You see, it's not just the death. It's not just the burial. But it's the resurrection of Jesus. But let's ask the question, what if? What if? What if what? What if we're wrong? What if I'm wrong? 
What if Christianity is wrong? What if the Bible is wrong? What if all of this stuff that we talk about, that we preach about, what if we're wrong? So the first point is, what if we are wrong? Well, Paul talks about this in this passage of Scripture, and I want you to just follow as we walk down through what he says. If we are wrong, now listen to me, I want everybody in the house that's here because you were drugged here by a friend, and they bribed you to get here. Whatever it took, they got you here, and you say, I don't even know if I believe in this God. I want you to listen really carefully. Because I know a whole lot of people that used to not believe in God, and now they serve God. But what if we're wrong? Well, if we're wrong, the Bible says in verse 14, now let's look at it together. We're going to walk right through this quickly. If we're wrong, our preaching is profitless. The Bible says in verse 14, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Vain means it's empty, it's futile, with no purpose or a colossal waste of time. If Christ is dead, you're looking at the biggest idiot in Jackson, Tennessee. If Christ is dead, listen to me, friend, I'm just being honest with you. If Christ is dead, then I'm wasting my time. We're wasting our time as a church of the living God if Christ is not alive. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Because this truth is the basis of our Christianity. I'm here to tell you, listen to what I'm saying. Jesus is not dead. He's alive. But what if? What if, number one, our preaching is profitless. Number two, our faith is foolish. Look at verse 14 again. The Bible says, then our preaching is vain, and your faith also is in vain. This means that you are trusting in something that doesn't deserve your trust. And what, what does it mean that our faith is foolish? Who wants to put your faith in Jesus if he's dead? I mean, think about it. This is why the Bible says, if you confess, watch this, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Listen, friend, friend, you cannot separate the death and the burial from the resurrection. That's the message. They go together. Our preaching is profit. What if we're wrong? Our preaching is profitless. Our faith is foolish. The disciples are deceivers, verse 15. The Bible says, moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses. Mm. The disciples are liars. They're deceivers. You see, he's not saying that they could have been mistaken. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying that they possibly could have misunderstood. He's not saying that they possibly could have been wrong. Paul is saying here, if there's no resurrection, they are deliberate false witnesses. A false witness is one who deliberately purges himself and becomes a liar in a courtroom. Paul says, we, the disciples, are testifying to the faith that he's not dead, but he's alive. What if? What if we're wrong? Our preaching is profitless. Our faith is foolish. Our, the disciples are deceived. Sin is sovereign. If we're wrong and Jesus didn't rise again, listen, sin is sovereign. Verse 17, the Bible says this. And if Christ had not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sin. Wow. Wow. This is saying that if Christ did not rise from the dead, then God has not accepted payment for your sins. It's not enough. Listen to me, church. It's not enough, child of God. It's not enough, Jackson, Tennessee. It's not enough, West Tennessee, just to believe in the death. Oh, a lot of people say Jesus was a good guy. He was a prophet. He was a teacher. He was a disciple. He's somebody to pat in your life after. But that's not enough. It's not enough. Listen, friend. It's not enough that he only died and was beaten and scourged and put a crown. No, it wasn't wasn't enough that he was buried. Friend, he had to rise again. Why? Because
because if he didn't, sin is sovereign. Sin is sovereign. Paul said he was delivered up for our offenses and raised for our justification. Now that's a big theological word, but without the resurrection, I wouldn't give you a half hallelujah for your hope of heaven. I just wouldn't. You see, no resurrection, no Savior, no Savior, no forgiveness. No forgiveness, no, no justification. No justification, no cleansing. No cleansing, you're a, you got to pay your own penalty for sin. And you can't do it. You see, if it weren't for Jesus, we would absolutely have to be perfect. Is there anybody perfect in the house? Go ahead and raise your hand because we're going to look at you and call you a liar. Right? There's nobody. How many messed up in the house? Y- y'all too happy about being messed up. <laughs> sin is sovereign. Sin is sovereign. But also death has dominion. Look in verse 18. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. You see, death has dominion if Christ did not rise from the dead. Death has dominion. God has not created you just to die. Some people think, man, when this, we live this life, this is it. This is it. I mean, some people live that way. They think that way. Man, if I can just do all I can do on this earth because this is it. Can I Listen, I got, I got good news and bad news for you. If you're a child of God, the good news is this ain't it. But, If you don't know Jesus Christ, the bad news is, this ain't it. You see, we need to understand that the the resurrection is so important. Death has dominion. What if we're wrong? Death has dominion. He created us to live here and then live again in eternity forever and ever and ever. Man, I have people all the time, they'll say, hey, hey, preacher, if God's such a God of love, why does God send people to hell? Listen, friend, God doesn't send anybody to hell. He created hell for the devil and his angels. He, he gave everything that he had his only begotten son to go through hell on this earth. For me and for you. And all we've got to do is say yes to Jesus and make Him our Lord and our Savior. Listen, friend, He he didn't create hell for you and me. He created heaven for those of us who would trust in Him. You see, what if? What if we're wrong? Death has dominion, but also the future is futile. Verse 19. The Bible says in verse 19, If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. The future is futile. This means that of this and all there is, this is it. This means that if all there is to life is this life, that's not too good. Ernest Hemingway said that it's, it's as though we are a colony of ants living on one end of a burning log. How sad. For the lost, this is their life. Nothing to really look forward to. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, this is it for you. Oh, there's an eternity out there. But listen, friend, I'm not looking forward to hell. I'm not looking forward to death. I'm looking forward to the life that I have after because there was a time and a place in my life where I said yes to Jesus. I give you my life. Here I am, Lord. Use me. One day, friend, when I die and I pass on from this life to the next, I'm going to be spending an eternity with the one who died for my sins, who was buried, and who, praised God, three days later, rose from the dead. He's alive and well. What if we're wrong? Well, if we're wrong, we have have no hope. But I got good news for you. We're not wrong. We're not wrong. We're not wrong. Why? Because the Bible says we're not wrong. Well, I don't know about that Bible. I don't know if I believe that it's inspired, it's infallible. I don't know if I believe it's inerrant. I don't know if I trust the Bible. Well, there are proofs of the resurrection. I mean, there's the empty tomb. 
It was guarded. There's the women in that were eyewitnesses. Mary Magdalene was one of those women. I mean, Jesus' apostles found new courage. I mean, Peter, if you know anything about the New Testament, you know, you know something about Peter. Peter was a, a man that lived a life like this, up and down, no consistency. He, he was not bold. Oh, he did some stupid stuff. We can all relate to him, right? Come on. But he did some really crazy things. But he wasn't really bold for Christ until after the resurrection. Things changed in his life. Changed lives of James, the half-brother of Jesus and others. You see, James was Jesus' half-brother. But he didn't all buy into this whole, my brother is God. You know, he didn't buy into all that. Until after the resurrection, and he became a leader in the church. If that's not good enough for you, listen to me. 500 eyewitnesses saw Jesus. Now, I don't believe in UFOs. Now, some of you do. Don't raise your hand if you do. But some of you do. Some of you watch that Sasquatch Bigfoot show every week. My father-in-law, he's one of them. Come on, amen? I mean, but here's the deal. If 500 people saw Bigfoot, I would have to believe in Bigfoot. 500 people saw Jesus with their own eyes. Listen, it's a fact, Jack. Jesus came out of the tomb. Five, con the conversion of Saul, which is now Paul. All these people, they, they, they became martyrs. They died for Jesus. Jesus is alive. So what if we're right? What if we're right? What if we're right? Then this statement is powerful. What statement? The statement that he made in John chapter 20, verses 6 and 7. John 20, 6 and 7. I want you to follow along with me. And so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb. And he saw the linen wrappings lying there. And the face cloth, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Now, most theologians believe that what he's literally saying there with, through the Greek language in this passage, that the... face cloth that was, had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up. That word rolled up literally means folded. So they walk in, and they see where Jesus was, and Jesus had somewhat tidied up. My wife would love that. We can't leave the house without her tidying up. Come on, baby. Nobody's coming by today. You never know. Let me get a wife or a mother like that. Very few, okay. So, so Jesus, I think, was making a statement. Well, what was he saying? Well, think about this. Before Jesus died and then after he rose again, he made a couple of statements that I think were very important. Number one, he said, it is finished on the cross. Remember that? Remember that? He said, it is finished. He gave up the ghost. He died. He said, it's finished. I've done it all. I've paid for the, the sin debt of the world. It is finished. And then he also made the statement later on after he rose again, before he ascended, he said, I'm coming back. So there's two statements here that I think that we need to pay close attention to that mean a lot to us. Here it is. Number one, it is finished. It is finished. Now, in this culture that Jesus lived in, there were a lot of carpenters, and carpenters, when they finished a job, what they would do is they would take their cloth, something like this, and they would fold the cloth up, and when they got done with the chair or the table or whatever they were building, they laid the folded cloth over the table, or over the, and they said, it is finished. Folks, listen to what I'm saying. 
When Jesus Christ took my sins and your sins upon himself on the cross of Jesus Christ, Jesus said, look, you don't have to do anything. You ain't got to work for it. You ain't got to be good enough. You don't have to go and buy your fancy clothes before you come to church. You don't have to do all this stuff that religion says you got to do. It is finished. I paid the price on the cross. It's finished. But then there's another statement, and I said it just a moment ago. Not only is it finished, but I'm coming back. First of all, child of God, he's coming back. He's coming back. So, also in this custom, in this day, when they were sitting around eating, which we're going to do when we get done here, come on. Mm. I'm thinking about that chicken and dressing already. Woo. Glory, hallelujah. I'm about to have a spell. Where was I? All right. I'm coming back. So in, in this day and age, in the culture, at this time, they would be sitting around a table. And they would have a servant that would be giving them food and taking their food up and taking their plates, etc., etc. When a man finished eating at the table, he would take his napkin and he would wad his napkin up. He would clean his hands. He would clean his beard because they like to have beards in the day. Think you want to be like Jesus? You need to grow a beard. Cover up your bubble. Amen. So they, he would wash his hands. He would, clean, he, would, he would clean his beard and everything. He, and he would throw it Throw it on the table. And that was the sign, hey, I'm done. But if dude had to get up, you know, for whatever reason, go feed the dog or whatever he had to do in the middle of supper, what he would do is he would fold his napkin and the servant would know that means I'll be back. Don't mess with my food. How many of you have ever got a salad just perfect? And you get up to go get something else. You just need a few bites of it. Man, you got it fixed just right. You got it oozing with ranch dressing, falling off the edges, bacon bits. Come on, amen. I mean, looking good, tasting good. And you come back and the waiter or the waitress done picked up your salad. Man, I get in the flesh when it comes to stuff like that. Don't mess with my salad. And so Jesus, Jesus is saying, look, the guy, here's the custom. If I fold it up and leave it, he's saying, I'll be back. Jesus folded up. The he took time, I think, to deliver you and I a message. It is finished. Praise God. It's done. But also, I'll be back. I'll be back. The statement is powerful. But then sanctification is expected. We like to say around here, we're messed up. We also like to say that we don't want to stay in that state. We want to grow. It's not a sprint, though. Come on, it's not a sprint. It's not a 40-yard dash. It's a journey. It's a marathon. Colossians, do I have that passage on the screen? Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ... Keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. Friend, listen to what I'm saying. God expects you and I to grow in our faith, to continue on with God. To become closer and closer and closer to God day after day. Yes, we're a messed up bunch of folks, but praise God, we don't have to stay in this messed up condition and position. We can grow a little bit at a time and become more like Jesus. Friend, look, we can look back and say, hey, that's where I was yesterday, and praise God, I'm here today. Maybe some of you take a step back. But guess what? You can take two steps forward. 
You may take another step back, but you can take another three steps forward. What I'm telling you is we don't need to be where we were here two and three and four years after our salvation. God wants us to grow. It's called sanctification, becoming more like Jesus. And then last, what if we're right? Salvation is a must. Salvation is a must. Look what he says in chapter 15, verse 20, 21, and 22. But now Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all men die. You want to hear some good news? Say, I want to hear some good news. So also in Christ, all will be made alive. Listen to me, friend. Jesus came. And Jesus died on that old rugged cross. He went through all the junk, all the stuff, all the torture, all the pain so that we could be born again, John 3, 3, so that we could be saved, so we can understand what it means to know Jesus in His fullness. Jesus died. I want you to listen to me. This is the most important time of the service. Jesus Christ died so that we could have life and have life abundantly and have life eternally. You see, 2,000 years ago, Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. We've talked a lot about lately how Jesus is the Son of God and He's the Son of Man. I mean, he's 100% man, but yet at the same time, He's 100% God. And there He is in the garden. He said, oh, oh God, my Father, please, Lord Jesus, let this cup pass from me. But if not, your will be done. And Jesus... his life you see that night that was Thursday he prayed into the evening early Friday right after midnight they came and got Jesus he went through seven trials seven trials from Thursday midnight all the way until he was put on the cross they took Jesus and they put a crown of thorns upon his head they didn't just set it there they crushed it down into his scalp until blood flowed they mocked him. Hell, King of the Jews. And they laughed and they mocked King Jesus, the one that took my sins and yours. They took a cat of nine tails with nine leather lashes with bone chips and metal chips on the end and they beat Jesus until his chest and his back looked like hamburger meat. He went through all that for me and for you. For us. They ultimately took Jesus. They laid him on an old rugged cross on the ground. They nailed him. Not through the hands that you see depicted in many pictures. Because the bones in the hands are too brittle. They wouldn't hold the weight of the body. But they took Jesus. Watch this. And they nailed him through the wrists. And he sat sat there. Listen, he could have called 10,000 angels. God, I don't want to do this. I'm not going to do this. Come get me off the cross. But he didn't do it. Why? Because he loves Ronnie Coleman. Because he loves you. He took the nails. They drove them. They drove them into his wrist. They drove him into his ankles. They had a big hole dug. They lifted the cross up. And when they lifted the cross up, it fell down into the deep hole in his body. Pain, just pain, just a whole lot of pain. He finally died. And he did that for me and for you. What if you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, let me ask you. What if we're right? And we are. <laughs> I believe with all my heart, we're right. 
The Bible is true. History records it. We're right. Eyewitnesses saw Jesus is alive. He's not dead. He did all that, but he didn't just die. He was buried and he rose again. It's true. It's true. What if we're right? If we're right, I sure wouldn't take a chance on my eternity. Let me just say there's no what ifs about it. There's no what ifs about it. Priscilla Shire had it right when she said this. There's no what ifs about it. He is. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He's the keeper of creation and creator of all. He's the architect of the universe and the manager of all time. He always was, always is, and always will be unmoved, unchanged, undefeated, and never undone. He was bruised, but brought healing. He was pierced, but eased pain. He was persecuted, but brought freedom. He was dead, but brings life. He was risen to bring power and raised to bring peace. There's no what ifs about it. He is. He is. The world cannot understand him. Armies cannot defeat him. Schools can't explain him. Leaders can't ignore him. Herod couldn't kill him. Nero couldn't crush him. And the new age cannot replace him. And Oprah Winfrey, if you're listening to the preacher today, you cannot explain him away. You see, there's no what ifs about it. He is. He is light. He is love. He is longevity. He is Lord. He is goodness and kindness and faithfulness. He is God. He is holy and righteous and powerful and pure. His ways are right. His word is eternal and his will is unchanged. There's no what ifs about it. His mind is on you and me. He doesn't hate you. He loves you. He's not out to get you. He's out to give you grace he's our savior our guide our peace our comfort and he rules our lives his goal is for us abundant life eternal life he is the wisdom of the wise he's the power of the powerful he's the ancient of days he's the ruler of rulers and leader of all leaders his goal is a relationship with me and with you he will never leave you he will never forsake you he will never mislead you, overlook you, and he'll never cancel your appointment that's in his appointment book. When you fall, he'll be there to lift you up. Come on, child of God. When you fall, he'll be there to pick you up. When you fail, he will forgive you. Come on, child of God. When you fail, he'll forgive you. When you're weak, He's strong. When you're lost, He's your way. When you're afraid, He's your courage. When you stumble, He'll steady you. When you're hurt, He'll heal you. When you're broken, He'll mend you. When you're blind, He'll lead you. When you're hungry, He'll feed you. During trials, He's with you. When I face persecution, He shields me. When I face problems, He'll comfort me. And when those of us that know Him as Lord and Savior, when the day comes that we pass on and we leave this earth, He'll carry us all home to meet Him. He is everything for everybody, everywhere, every time, in every way. You see, there's no what ifs about it. He is God. There's no what ifs about it. He is Savior. There's no what ifs about it. He did die. There's no what ifs about it. He did. They, they did bury him. There's no what ifs about it. He did rise from the dead. There's no what ifs about it. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. He is God in the flesh, baby. Do you know him? Do you know him? I tell you, I'm glad when I was 16 years of age, I met him. He changed my life. Well, I just don't know if I believe in all that Christian stuff. I don't know if I buy into all that church 
business. Friend, it's not about church. It's not about religion. It's about a relationship with God. Do you know him? Do you know him? You can know him today. You can know him today. Today can be the greatest day of your life. Today you can pass from death to life. Today, today, not tomorrow, not next week, but today, today can be the greatest day of your life. Why? Because you can come face to face with God Almighty through His Son, Jesus Christ, and you can experience Him for the very first time as being King of kings, Lord of lords, and the one that died, was buried, and rose again for your sins. You can know Him today. You can know Him today.